Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Office Hours, where you post questions at the URL in the description of the video, and then you can upvote which people's questions you want to see answered on the next Office Hours. Here in Las Vegas today, getting ready to set up for my uh, uh, Mastering Server Tuning class next week, doing that live. Uh, so got all my video gear all set up and going, so I thought, hey, why not answer a few questions? First one we'll start with, especially because there are some good ones in the queue. This is a really good one. From uh, Jeremy asks, we have an older application and we're getting ready to rewrite it to use microservices. We're also going to migrate it from on-prem to Azure. Our development consulting is recommending that we use Postgres rather than SQL Server to save money. What are your thoughts on moving between the two? Okay, so the first question you want to ask is, how much are you going to save over, let's just say, the next five years? Have them sketch out what the difference is in, in, in savings. And then, then go compare that to what's it going to cost you to get the developers up to speed on a new database platform? Because they're going to have to write queries differently. The way they're going to do performance tuning is different. The way they're going to do performance troubleshooting is different. It's not like you get to simply take all of your skills and port them over to another database platform easily. I say that as someone who uses Postgres. Uh, when Richie and I started architecting SQL Constant Care, our monitoring product for SQL Server, we chose to use Postgres on the back end for that exact money to save or to save money. It was chose that for the exact same reason to save money. Uh, but in our case, it was relatively easy because it was only Richie. He was the only developer that we have. We it's just me and him, uh, and so it was relatively inexpensive to get him up to speed and then to save money on the SQL Server licensing long term. The more developers that you have, the less likely that is that the case. You may have to send people to a couple few weeks of training classes or bring in a trainer. And I'm not saying that as a sales pitch for me because I don't do that work. Uh, next up, uh, Peter asks, have you ever deleted unused statistics, or do you think it might be worth doing? My pain is an, un an exceptionally long-running stat or stats update. I really I love how you put what your pain is, because so often I have to ask people, why are you doing that? What's the pain that you're trying to solve? In this case, deleting stats would seem like it would uh, relieve that pain. But here's the problem. If anybody runs a query on a column, it'll auto-generate statistics immediately after just one query, which is kind of weird and counterintuitive. You'd think that SQL Server would maybe wait a few times that a stat would be needed, but just boom, it immediately goes off and creates one. So you could try deleting it, but when you delete them, you're just going to cause auto stats to be created, which means they're also going to be sampled, uh, which means you're also going to lose any persisted stat sampling that you might have set up as well. So for me, that's never been something that's gotten me across the finish line. But I would understand why if you wanted to try to do it. Just now you know why it probably won't get you across the finish line. Jacob asks, how do you approach tuning a query when you can't run it in production? Well, I run it in development. Well, if you can't run it in development, well, why don't we have a development server? That would trigger me start asking that, uh, asking that question. But the other thing that I would say is, because I'm old, I, look, I'm pushing 50. I've been working with SQL Server for a couple of decades. Usually I can look at a query and go, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. So my answer, of course, is going to be, I'm just going to look at the query, and I can kind of guess what kind of execution plan we're going to end up with. Worst case scenario, I could display the estimated execution plan. I go, oh, I bet that's wrong. I bet that's wrong. I bet that's wrong. But the other thing, uh, that's just because I've been doing this for like 20 years. The other thing I should point out is you should have a monitoring tool. You should have a monitoring tool that gathers execution plans in production, and you should be able to go look at those. So there's a few answers for you there. Next up, Kimberly asks, I'm battling sysadmins in my org. They want Veeam backups for all my SQL servers and not SQL backups. I understand why they want them. It's easier to use one single tool to back up everything. 
says they claim point in time recovery with Veeam. I say my logs are getting not getting truncated, so Veeam is not talking to SQL. Can you point me to a doc that will support this? Okay, first off, read the Veeam manuals. They're available online on the web. You don't have to buy Veeam. You could just go Google for the document with the version that you have and the manual. You can read the manuals and see how it works. The other thing is, ask your sysadmins for a point in time recovery, except you give the time. You say, hey, from production, I want to take the backup from yesterday at 3.15 p.m. Get me the backup from production yesterday at 3.15 p.m. Restore that over in a development environment. Then you go look at your fastest changing table. You probably have something like sales line items. Go to the most recent sales line items in the restore table. That'll help you figure out what exact point in time the database was restored at. If you ask for, say, 3.17 p.m. and they give you 3 p.m., well, that tells you that you don't really have point in time recovery. What they're claiming, probably. Now, and Veeam can do a point in time recovery with a transaction log, too, as well. Just all depends on how you configure it. Just like SQL Server, if you configure backups poorly, you don't get point in time recovery. Or often when I, I work with sysadmins who haven't configured these backup tools correctly, they say we have point in time recovery, but then when I ask for a specific point, we don't actually have that. We just have a couple of points in time. Uh, next up, Cats Everywhere says, Hey Brent, I'm planning a new SQL Server build. I expect that the business people will want this server to exist for 8 to 10 years. That's fair. Um, are there any good arguments business people would love to persuade them to stick to a 5-year max? I picked 5 years due to patching support for Microsoft. No, I mean, so today we're in 2022. 2022 is just about over, but SQL Server 2012, I still see all the time out in production. I understand why people do it. If you were going to do a brand new SQL Server build today, and let's just say that you chose SQL Server 2019, it's a pretty doggone good version. There's a lot of good stuff inside there. I can see how it would have legs for 8 to 10 years. Plus, a lot of applications don't need SQL Server's recent features, don't need a lot of the recent fancy pants features. Now, as database administrators, we may want the newer version, but just may not be able to get it. I don't have a problem with saying, yes, it's uh, an 8 to 10 year expiration date is reasonable. If the database isn't growing like crazy, it's not like you're building a .com, and if we expect that the size is going to be pretty stable, the user count is going to be pretty stable, it's not unusual to see those kinds of expiration dates. Olafur says, any indexing tips for select distinct F123? Uh, yeah, think of it as group by, because in order to do a distinct, you have to do a group by. In order to group data, you have to order it. So it's essentially the same as saying order by F123. And if you've been through my Fundamentals of Index Tuning class, then you've already learned how to index for order by, especially in combinations with the WHERE clause. So there you go. Uh, and then we'll do one more. Uh, Bingo Boy. <laughs> Bingo Boy says, what are the pros and cons of setting up a SQL Server learning environment using uh, containers instead of uh, virtual machines? When you're learning, because you said that you want to do it for learning, you want to learn the thing that you're going to use in production. If you learn something else, you're wasting your time. I'm going to Spain next month. I'm not, but let's just say I'm going to Spain next month. I think I should learn France, French. French is right next to Spain. It's really similar, right? I bet that if I spend time learning French, I'll have an easy time over in Spain. Nah, not really. You might find some people who know French, but you might as well learn the language of whatever it is that you're actually going to be using. So focus on that. All right, well, there's a handful of quick answers. Oh, we got it in less than 10 minutes. So there's a handful of quick answers. Hopefully y'all learned something, and I will see y'all on the next office hours. Time for me to go out and get some morning coffee. It's about 6.30 a.m. I think my local coffee shop has their pastries up and running by now. So I'm out of here. Adios.